In the last episode on testing, we looked at maximum flow rate and printing speed for the Hamira Hotend and Extruder. And we found that you could print at up to 10.9 millimeters cubed per second with PLA at 220 degrees Celsius, which is about equivalent to 94 millimeters per second with a 0.3 layer height and 0.45 millimeter line width. Even though I did a temperature test as part of that, one of the comments on the last video suggested that if I increase the temperature, I can therefore increase the flow rate and print even faster. So we better test it out. Hello everyone, my name's Adam and welcome back to the channel. So today, as I've mentioned, we're going to be trying to find out if you can increase your hot end maximum flow rate and therefore the maximum printing speed you can achieve just by increasing the nozzle temperature. The setup we're going to be used for today's testing is the E3D Hamira with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle and a 30 watt heater. This is the standard Hamira. The tension is going to be set to the maximum minus one turn. The material we're going to be using is this Royal Blue PLA from Oosnest. To identify the effects that the temperature has on the hot end flow rate, we're going to be using temperatures of 220, 240 and 260 degrees Celsius. The flow rates we're going to be using range from around seven up to around 16 and a half millimeters cubed per second, with a total of 10 different flow rates being tested. The method that we're going to be using today is basically the weight method that we used in the last video. I'll be preheating the nozzle and loading the filament before the test starts. The test G-code runs 10 different flow rates while keeping the nozzle obviously at the target temperature using standard PID control. The test sample then gets weighed and that weight is recorded. I repeated each temperature three times and took an average. But as we saw last time, low flow rates is not the only part of poor extrusion. There are also effects on the extrusion diameter and the diameter of the test sample or helix. So I'm going to measure these with a pair of digital calipers to see what we can find. I expect a lot more error in these measurements because these parameters are quite difficult to measure consistently, but I'll do my best and we'll see what the results suggest. So with all of those parameters, we have a total of 90 data points. So that's quite a lot of information to collect, but in the process, I do get to watch the printer print out these beautiful little helix shapes. For the results, first let's look at the overall helix diameter. Firstly, I think it's quite clear to see that as you increase the temperature, the overall diameter of the helix decreases. I suspect this is because as the filament is reaching higher temperature, the viscosity reduces. Viscosity is a parameter of how easy a fluid can flow. So when it reduces, the molten filament flows easier and would likely be more flexible, allowing a tighter bend and therefore smaller helix. There also seems to be a relationship between these three series. For example, a 10 millimeter helix diameter was achieved with 220 degrees Celsius at around seven millimeters cubed per second, 240 degrees Celsius at 11 millimeters cubed per second, and also 260 degrees Celsius at 14 millimeters cubed per second. This suggests to me the viscosity of the filament was equal for these three tests. So perhaps the filament leaving the hot end is equal temperature in all of these cases. The slower flow rate will have had more time to heat up, but was heating up a little bit slower, whilst the faster flow rate had more heating, so heated up quicker, and overall comes out seemingly to about the same. Perhaps the higher temperature is allowing the filament to become less viscous more quickly, and so can get the filament to an appropriate print temperature in less time. I also took all the results from each temperature series and took an average to confirm the change in helix diameter with temperature, and it certainly seems to be true. Increasing temperature decreases average diameter. Moving on to the extrusion diameter now, these results are all represented relative to the nozzle diameter, which was 0.4 millimeters. So if the extrusion diameter is also 0.4 millimeters, it will show up as 100% on this graph. Interestingly, all the values measured were significantly above this. My expectation was that gravity acting on the unsupported filament would stretch it out slightly and decrease the diameter. All of these samples are cooling naturally, so perhaps turning on the part cooling fan and cooling the filament as soon as it leaves the nozzle would provide a more accurate measurement for the actual extrusion diameter at the point when it leaves the nozzle. Regarding improvements of flow rate with temperature though, there seems to be a linear performance up to around 13 millimeters cubed per second on the 220 degree series before a rapid increase. Although I'm not sure what's happening here. 
The same looks to be true with the 240 degrees series and at a similar flow rate too. But at 260 degrees, the rapid increase appears to be delayed until after around 14 millimeters cubed per second and would only appear in these results if we had analyzed higher flow rates, a limitation of the range of flow rates chosen for testing. Perhaps it would look kind of like this. On the basis that this significant change in extrusion diameter would have undesirable effects on the print results, knowing that higher temperature seems to extend the usable range could be an advantage. However, this change does seem to be quite small, perhaps one to two millimeters cubed per second, and this may be a limit of the material. If we take averages of the three series again, we can see that higher temperatures will indeed allow you to control the diameter of the extrusion better, closer to the target. Although of course this is a kind of free forming extrusion diameter, so maybe not necessarily represented in the same way on a real print. Now lastly, let's move on to the weight measurements. Firstly, if we look at just 240C and 260C tests, across the full range their changes seem to always be similar, particularly this plateau peak at 12 to 13 millimeters cubed per second. It seems like extrusion quantity doesn't just decline with flow rate, but rather there are optimal areas for flow rate within this range. Interestingly, 260 degrees Celsius almost always performs worse than 240 degrees Celsius when it comes to extrusion quantity at any flow rate. Looking at only the 220 and 240 tests, we again see fluctuations across the full range with a trend towards lower relative extrusion quantity as flow rate increases. I suspect that there may also be some interference from the PID control system being a little bit off from the temperature that it needs to be. Perhaps this is something we could test in a future video. Taking a quick look at all the data back together, we can see that some fairly poorly fitting trend lines do indicate that the performance of all these temperatures is actually quite close, and they all tend downwards as the flow rate increases. As we did before, I've averaged all the mass data from each temperature, and this suggests to me that overall, the increase in temperature doesn't allow for higher average flow rate. But as we did previously, we need to find out how this information affects real world prints, so we need to do an actual print. For the printing tests, I've designed this 100 by 200 by 120 millimeter cuboid with filleted corners. I'll print this object three times, once at each temperature, and the flow rate will increase from the bottom to the top, starting at seven millimeters cubed per second and finishing a little faster than our other tests at 18.8 millimeters cubed per second and changing every 10 millimeters of height. For this test, I've increased the PLA flow rate limit in Prusa Slicer to 20 millimeters cubed per second and removed any slowdown parameters that would have been there to allow for the part cooling. This should give us a really great representation of the extrusion performance, as we'll see any effects of the extrusion in the part as it prints, and afterwards we can just measure the height to find out what flow rate that happened at. Before we look at the test results though, you should subscribe to make sure you don't miss more videos like this one where we're testing 3D printers and their components. Now, let's get on with the print results. This is the 220 degrees test. While it's not very easy to see, there are definitely visible segments of the print that reflects where the speed and flow rate change. The bottom four segments are just about visible, while five and onwards all become a little bit of a blur. The first three segments have some level of gloss, but four loses some of that and five is matte, like basically the rest of the upper segments. On the assumption that gloss is good and matte is bad, the first three speeds were optimal at 220 degrees Celsius, which actually only takes us up to 8.6 millimeters cubed per second. That's over two millimeters cubed per second slower than we predicted for the maximum flow rate in the previous video. So maybe there's something going on there. Unfortunately, the lack of infill resulted in bowed walls, and this may have affected the visibility of changes in speed. It does make for a nice drum though. Moving on to the 240 degree C test. Firstly, the visible changes between the segments are even less visible than before, even with optimal lighting. Interestingly, the first two segments are the most glossy. After that, they are still fairly high gloss, just a little bit less. This suggests to me that the flow rate all the way up the print was within the hot ends capability, apart from one major factor. It caused a thermal runaway. This happens when the temperature of the thermistor drops, even though the heater is fully operational. After checking for loose heaters, 
I can only conclude that the heat was being drawn out of the hot end so fast by the filament that it cooled faster than the hot end could keep up with. However, it did remain glossy, which suggests the temperature was fine. At 260 degrees Celsius, we see a clearer result. I can see about the first seven segments of speed and can tell quite a clear difference in gloss between the top and the bottom of the print, although it seems like not all of these really show up on camera. Notably though, even the lowest gloss level on the 260 degrees test is still higher than the highest gloss level on the 220 degrees C test. At the very top flow rate at 260 degrees Celsius and 18.8 millimeters cubed per second, there doesn't seem to be any significant effects on the flow rate below what we've seen with the 220 degrees C test, which suggests to me that the Hamira hot end is actually plenty capable of that flow rate too. With all of that confusion, I think it's time for a conclusion. And of course we need to do that while considering the initial question. Can you print at higher flow rates just by increasing the nozzle temperature? Sort of, yes. As we looked at in the last episode, there was no fixed flow rate limit that we found in the range that was being tested. We determined that the highest performance was a mix of flow rate and appearance. We picked the highest flow rate where the appearance in the test samples had not significantly declined. So by the same process then, I guess 10.9 millimeters cubed per second is not really the maximum flow rate for the Hemira, it's more just the best flow rate for 220 degrees Celsius when using PLA. If you really want to print faster, it looks like you probably can, even up to around 18.8 millimeters cubed per second if you really, really crank the temperature. But with that added speed and temperature, you do start to come across another enemy, and that is cooling. If you're doing maybe a small print like a standard Benchy with very fast speeds and a 260 degrees Celsius nozzle, well, you're, it's just very quickly going to turn into an amorphous blob because that print just can't dissipate thermal energy fast enough, even with a fan for that forced convection. This is one of the reasons why my test prints for doing this are really quite so large. I mean, this is a 200% scale bench sheet that I did in the middle of that process as well. You need to allow for plenty of layer time and surface area to allow the parts to cool. For example, this doesn't meet the layer time requirement, but it does have very large surface area for cooling, and there's no infill to splooge loads of hot filament in. Also, I can't really smell a thing, so I didn't really notice, but PLA can apparently be very smelly when you start printing it at 260 degrees Celsius, so that might be another consideration that you want to think about before going ahead with such a hot print. For my final point, I'm also going to conclude that flow rate is really complicated. I mean, it's easy to understand. You push in filament, it gets hot, and it comes out the nozzle. That process is simple, but when you start looking into the details of the viscosity of the filament, the heating process, heat transfer, diffusion in the material, and all these other kind of parameters that determine that final performance, it really does start to come a little bit more complex than you might have first imagined. So let's summarize everything with this final statement. By increasing your printing temperature from 220 up to 240 or even 260 degrees Celsius, it seems you can have quite a significant effect on the quality of the extrusion regarding its viscosity and uniformity, especially at peak flow rates. However, we do need to keep in mind that PLA print quality can be significantly affected without sufficient cooling and increasing the print temperature to 260 degrees Celsius isn't going to help with that. Ultimately, it seems from my testing here today that the nozzle temperature is not really the thing that matters most, more the temperature distribution throughout the filament cross section as it's being extruded. And maybe that's something we can take a look at in the future. Hopefully you found that interesting and it's given you some information on how you can maybe improve your print performance by increasing your printing or slash nozzle temperature. So that's going to be it from me today. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.